The inspiration for the Jack Tyrell thrillers came about during an annual reread of my favorite book, A Christmas Carol by Charles Dickens. I wanted to write a thriller, but I wanted to write a character who undergoes a deeply spiritual journey, as Dickens wrote for Ebenezer Scrooge. Suddenly, the first three Tyrell books popped into my head, as did my hero, Jack Tyrell, an extraordinarily capable man who has to overcome his demons by righting wrongs and helping others, with a little assist from the other side. I've never had that kind of immediate inspiration strike in my whole career. In the very first paragraph of the whole series, Tyrell's wife Maggie is murdered by the Mafia in retribution for Tyrell's failure to deliver on a bribe. He spirals into heavy drinking and scaring people into paying their not-so-legal debts. On the fifth anniversary of his wife's death, Maggie's ghost appears to Jack, just as Marley's ghost appears to Scrooge. Maggie has interceded with the chairman, as God is called in these novels, to give Tyrell a second chance. Maggie arranges for Jack to meet Harry, his spiritual guide, who introduces him to the people who need his help. Jack will become a writer of wrongs. This introduction mirrors Marley's introduction of the spirits of Christmas past, present, and yet to come. But for Jack, there's a catch. After he helps someone, they will never remember him. And there are no guarantees of success or survival. Jack has to be completely selfless. Fortunately for Jack, being completely selfless doesn't mean that wonderful things don't happen in his life. And the most wonderful of all is meeting Kim Gannon, the woman he's going to build the rest of his life with, assuming he lives that long. It was my fault that my wife was murdered. Right on the front steps of our home. I was shot too. Almost killed. I deserved it. Maggie did not. We were walking home from a movie, a romantic comedy. Maggie thought it was fun. I hated it. But I was in such a foul mood those days that I could have seen a double showing of Casablanca and Play It Again Sam and hated them both. No matter what I saw, or did, I would have hated it because... Because I hated myself. I was a U.S. Marshal and had accepted a bribe. There you have it. The unvarnished ugliness at the core of my being. Despite years of service with the Marshals and before that in the U.S. Army Special Forces, I had taken money from some loathsome criminals who planned to kill other loathsome criminals who happened to be in the Marshals' Witness Protection Program. Please don't think that I jumped up and said, sure, I'll take your money. I wasn't that easy. Like a lot of veterans returning from Afghanistan or Iraq, I suffered from PTSD. And like a lot of us, I had a hard time admitting that I had a problem and seeking help for it. Instead of therapy, I drank. I drank a lot. I hung out in bars that catered to federal agents of all sorts. DEA, FBI, Treasury, and Marshals. Just as there are bars for feds, there are bars for cops and for bad guys. Both the good guys and the bad guys are aware of this. It makes it easier for law enforcement to find suspects in bad guy bars. At the same time, it's easy for the criminal element to identify those in law enforcement who might be approachable regarding bribery. Odds are that at least one federal agent who gets soused on a regular basis is susceptible to an offer of easy money. And since I was avoiding therapy, which was bitterly ironic because my wife was a therapist, I self-medicated with booze in the same place most nights. Dugan's Pub. Instead of going home to Maggie, 
I told her I was working late on a case. I often did work late, and she believed me. Now that I think about it, she was probably pretending to believe me. It was a live convenience that we both shared. If I was honest with myself, something that was difficult in the extreme, I had to admit that she had tried to help me. Suggestions that we go for long walks where there would be nothing to do but admire the scenery and talk. Suggestions that we drive into the country and admire the scenery and talk. Suggestions that we spend the evening at home listening to music and talking. Maggie had a mischievous sense of humor and a great line of flirtation, but heaven forbid we should just talk. Crying out loud, she was a therapist. She was a caring and concerned person and she would have figured out what a mess I was. I couldn't have that. Well, the first few times Dami G approached me about passing information to him, I waved him off with an obscenity or two. But I didn't report his offer to my supervisors, which is what you're supposed to do when criminals attempt to bribe you. He continued to proposition me to do him a favor. My cursing must have been losing its effectiveness because he repeated his offer again and again. One night, I pushed my $20 bill across the bar and the bartender pointed Dominic's direction and told me Dominic was buying. I should have left the 20 and paid for my own drinks, told Dominic where to go and informed my supervisors. Eventually, I slid down the slippery slope of immorality. I rationalized that it was okay to accept the bribe. I didn't work in witness protection, so I couldn't possibly deliver the information and betray the marshal service. Oh sure, I occasionally delivered to the witness protection subjects, many of them criminals, to a handler, but the path to their actual ultimate destination, their newfound lives of comfort and security, had several steps. I was just a way station in the process. But after delivery, I had no clue what happened to them. It was impossible for me to give the mobsters what they wanted. So if I took the bribe, I'd just be stealing from some very bad people. Didn't seem particularly immoral to me. The elephant in this particular room of my drunken head was that Dominic and company wouldn't appreciate being ripped off by me. But I dismissed these fears. <laughs> I'd survived the war in Afghanistan. A couple of mobsters didn't frighten me. Besides, they were really stupid enough to risk the inevitable manhunt that would follow the whacking of a law enforcement officer. The deal was 50000 up front with another 50000 when I handed over the information. One night, I met Dominic a couple of blocks from my usual bar. He handed me a plain white shopping bag with a shoebox inside and walked off without saying another word. The bag felt heavier than a pair of shoes. 50,000 hundreds is a bit bulky. <laughs> I felt very pleased with myself for having earned that much money by lying to criminals. Very pleased. For about five minutes. Then it hit me that I had dishonored everything I had ever stood for, as a marshal, and a soldier, and a husband. Everything my wife believed about me. I couldn't live with myself or my wife who cared so much about others that she had become a therapist, whose sense of humor was sly and surprising had brown hair, blue eyes, and a small scar over her left eye from a childhood fall on her bike. Maggie was disproportionately self-conscious about the little scar. She shouldn't have worried. It was barely noticeable. It was, it was beautiful. She was beautiful. After the movie, we had walked along West 76th Street, heading away west, away from Columbus Avenue, and toward our home on the third floor of a brownstone. 
The June night was pleasantly warm. A light breeze rustled the leaves, and we had strolled down the sidewalk, hand in hand. It had taken every bit of mental fortitude I possessed not to yank mine from hers. It was beyond me why she would want to hold my hand. Yes, the hand I'd taken the bribe with. It had also been impossible to enjoy a stroll on a wonderful June evening with my wife when I was spending most of my mental energy scanning every doorway and window and rooftop wondering if someone was about to kill me. I had been stupid and immoral enough to take money from criminal scum and reneging on my deal with the scum left me in a state of fear. Not to mention the phone call I received earlier that day. I picked up the phone and said, hello? A man's voice replied, well, we're waiting. As we climbed up the stoop to our building, Maggie released my hand and fished in her purse for her keys. There was a noise like the tearing of a piece of paper, and in a fraction of a second, something smashed into my right shoulder and slammed me against the door frame. As I fell, another something hit my leg. There was a distant sound of footsteps pounding away, slowly fading out of hearing. I lay on my back, sprawled on the landing at the top of the stoop, breathing hard. I touched my shoulder and felt a jagged tear in my shirt and skin. My fingers came away, covered in blood. I gazed up and realized the glass in the door was broken. Where was Maggie? I slowly rolled onto my stomach until I could see down the stoop. She was crumpled at the bottom, her legs on the sidewalk, her torso on the steps, all of her covered in blood. Her head lay on one of the stone steps, her face towards me, her eyes wide open and sightless. I tried to call out her name, but couldn't collect enough breath to make a sound. She couldn't be dead. She couldn't. The bullets were meant for me. I had taken the bribe and never delivered. This was payback for me. What had I done to my Maggie? My breathing was more strained as I pushed myself over the edge of the landing and down the steps. Every nerve in my body screamed with pain. I rolled down the last steps and came to an uncontrolled stop with my head in her lap. She didn't move. I reached out and took her hand, gave it a gentle squeeze. Nothing. I whispered her name. No answer. The sound of sirens filled the air, and I blacked out.